Hey everybody, Pastor Steven Anderson here from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. This is part three in a video series responding to the King James Only Controversy by Dr. James White. This chapter three is called Starting at the Beginning. Now in this chapter, he just lays down a lot of basic principles and he even says on the second page of the chapter that you may want to just skip this chapter. He says, uh, if you're already familiar with such issues as the languages in which the Bible was first written, the types of manuscripts that Christians used, basic errors that people make when hand copying documents and the like, you may wish to move on to chapter four. Okay, it's a pretty long chapter though. And uh, he starts out by kind of just insulting people that are King James only. He says, the KJV only controversy plays upon the fact that most Christians today are more than slightly fuzzy on the particulars of how we got the Bible, how it was passed down through the years, and how it has been translated into the English language. So James White always likes to act like he's so smart and everybody else is so dumb and people that are King James only aren't smart and, and blah, blah, blah. So obviously that's not really an argument. So he gets into the biblical languages. He explains that the Bible was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and that you know barely any chapters were written in Aramaic. So we're predominantly talking about Hebrew and Greek. Then on page 44, he again uh, talks about how Greek far exceeds English in its ability to convey intricate meanings and delicate turns of thought. I disagree with that. English is a very expressive language. It's very unequivocal, very clear. Um, it's every bit as clear as Greek. And so I, I don't agree with him on that. But anyway, uh, then he gets into this part on disputes over translation. And he makes a very important point here when he talks about how there are two different issues at work here. And in fact, I did a whole sermon on this recently. It was called Two Problems with the Modern Versions. And number one is textual disputes, and number two, translation disputes. So when we talk about the differences between the King James Bible and the ESV, for example, or whatever the modern version, there are two different issues at play here. There's the textual issue, and there's the translation issue. So sometimes these versions read differently because they're coming from a different text. Sometimes they read differently because they're just translated differently. For example, when you have the new versions leaving out entire verses like Acts 8.37 or 1 John 5.7, that's obviously not a translation difference. That's a difference in the underlying text, okay? But then when you have, uh, oh, and he gives some examples here. I'll just use his examples. Uh, for example, John 6.47 in the King James says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Whereas the modern translations will say, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. So what's missing? The King James says, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. The new versions just say, he that believes has everlasting life. So, you know, believes anything, right? So anyway, um, this is a textual difference, obviously. The underlying Greek text of the modern versions leaves out on me, whereas the Textus Receptus has the on me. Then he gives another example, John 3.36. This is a translation dispute. It says in the King James, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So the New American Standard, you know, representing the modern versions, says he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So uh, one of them says that you're not saved because you don't believe, and the other one says you're not saved because you don't obey. All right, That's a pretty big difference. That's an important difference. And of course, the King James is right, and the modern versions are wrong. Salvation is by faith alone, and it's not believing that causes people to be unsaved. But here's the thing. They're both translating from the same underlying Greek text. It's that one of them is translating it wrongly as he that does not obey. Because the, the problem with that is that that makes it sound like you have to do works to be saved. You have to obey Christ. You have to keep the commandments and uh, do the good things that he tells you to do and not do the bad things that he tells you not to do. When in reality, the only thing you have to do to be saved is believe. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
By the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. The Bible defines the works of the law as obeying the commandments, even negative commandments. Not doing bad things is the works of the law. You can prove that by comparing scripture in Galatians with Deuteronomy. I'm not going to go into that. I've, I've done sermons on that. And then there are good works, which are the good things that Christ tells us to do. And uh, neither of them are required for salvation. Okay, Faith is required for salvation. So um, those are examples of a, a textual dispute in John 6, 47 and a translation dispute in John 3, 36. So the modern versions are filled with problems, not just because of bad text, but also just garbage translation. Okay, now, then he goes into the issue of methods of translation in verse 46. And he explains that no translation is completely formal. I'm quoting here. Even translations considered formal, such as the KJV, New KJV, and NASB, contain dynamic translations, for at times there is simply no way to make sense of an entirely literal translation. Now, he is right about this, okay? He explains that when it comes to translation, there are literal methods and then dynamic equivalence methods. Now, here's where a lot of King James onlyists have been wrong over the years, okay? They know that the new versions are wrong. They know they're bad, but sometimes they don't know exactly why or what's wrong with them. And so sometimes what you'll hear King James only people say is, well, you know, the King James is a word for word translation and it's very literal. Whereas the new versions are just these really loose translations, dynamic equivalents. And they, they, they act like dynamic equivalence is bad and literal is good. Well, they're wrong about that because, of course, as Dr. White pointed out here, the King James uses dynamic equivalents in many places, and the modern versions are literal in many places. In fact, many times the modern versions are too literal, and that's sometimes why they sound so stupid. You know, when you listen to the modern versions, he hath told thee, O oh, human one. You know, they, they, they call you human one instead of man. Uh, they get so clinical and so literal in their translation that they sound wooden and, and, and awkward, and they're bad translations. So the King James is not this super literal word-for-word -word translation that a lot of people believe it is. Now, it obviously is accurate, you know, and it, and it is correctly translating what's there. Uh, I believe it's perfect, it's excellent, but it's not word-for-word. -word because a word-for-word -word translation is a garbage translation, okay? If you want a word-for-word -word translation, just type a bunch of stuff into Google Translate and, and look how ugly it comes back at you when it just translates word-for-word, -word, okay? Now, I've actually worked as a translator. My wife has worked as a translator. And when you're doing translation, the way you can tell that it's a good translation is that if someone read the finished product, they wouldn't even know it's a translation, okay? Have you ever gotten the instructions for something and you read them and you just knew right away this was not originally written in English, okay? Why? Because it's a, it's a garbage translation. A good translation is one where you read it and you would think it was originally written in that language. And that's how the King James is. When you read the King James, it's so good, you would think that the Bible was originally written in English. In fact, People often make fun of people who are King James or children growing up thinking that the Bible was written in English. But that's actually just a testament to how good the translation is that children think that the King James is written in English. Or I'm sorry, of course the King James, but children think that the Bible was originally written in English because the King James is just that good. I know when I was a little toddler and, and a small child, you know, I thought that God and everybody in heaven speaks English and that you know, the Jesus walked the earth speaking English because it's that good. Boy, you wouldn't think that reading these modern versions. They're so awkward and, and wooden and sometimes overly literal. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that the King James is this really literal translation and that the problem with the modern versions is that they're not literal enough. That's not the problem with the modern versions, okay? The problem with the modern versions is that number one, they're based on corrupted manuscripts. And number two, they contain a lot of bad translation. And when we say bad translation, it's not because it's dynamic equivalence necessarily, although that's sometimes an issue. 
but it's influenced by scholarship of wicked people, heretics, apostates, and just Christ rejecting Jews. I mean, let me just give you an example, okay? Like, for example, when you're reading the Old Testament in the King James, it talks about being clean versus unclean, okay? I mean, that's pretty straightforward, right? What's clean mean? It means that it's not dirty. What's unclean mean? It means that it's dirty. So the Bible talks about being clean versus being unclean, okay? Well, modern scholarship of the Jews and so forth, they believe in a thing called ritual impurity. And they say, oh, well, when it says clean and unclean, that doesn't really mean, you know, clean and dirty. It actually is talking about being ritually impure. And so some of these modern translations will literally have a leper walking through the city and instead of yelling unclean, they're yelling, ritually impure, ritually impure. That's ridiculous, okay? And it's based on Christ rejecting Judaism's inability to understand God's word, okay? Jews can't understand the Bible. They have the veil over their eyes, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So they have come up with this bizarre concept that unclean has nothing to do with sanitation. That's what they think, okay? When in reality, the Bible has all these wonderful teachings about sanitation, about how we should use running water, and if somebody's sick, wash the sheets, wash the bed, wash the house, wash your clothes, wash your body. God's teaching us how to be sanitary. They say, oh, this has nothing to do with that. They try to claim that leprosy back then wasn't even contagious. And that, you know, God just has them saying ritually impure because it's ritual impurity. Nothing to do with spreading germs or sanitation. Look, they just don't want to give God credit for being so ahead of his time in the Bible and having all these wonderful teachings on cleanliness and sanitation that were way ahead of their time. So the Jews want to take away God's glory and just say, oh, it's ritual impurity. Those are the kind of ideas that make their way into the modern versions, okay? Where you'll change uncleanness to ritual impurity or something like that. And that's just one example. But we can go on, on and on with just the bad scholarship and bad translations and doctrinal bias of wicked people that gets into these new versions, okay? Like changing not believing to not obeying, okay? So, you know, he's right to point out that there are two issues at work here, uh, textual problems and translation problems. And then also he's right to point out that this isn't about literal versus dynamic equivalence because, you know, the King James uses both. The NIV uses both. Uh, the ESV uses both. And sometimes dynamic equivalence is better than literal, okay? Uh, because a good translation captures not word for word, but it captures the spirit of the original, the feeling of the original. The, it, it gets the word for word sometimes or when possible, but often it's thought for thought, okay? But, you know, God says don't add or remove a word, okay? But obviously when you go from language to language, there are going to be words added and removed, which is why there are words in italics. But, but you're not removing the substance of anything. You're not removing any meaning, okay? Obviously, when you translate into another language, you can't go word for word. If you did, it would be a horrible translation. It would sound horrible, and it would not make sense. Okay, so he goes through and gives some examples of that, of, of the King James using dynamic equivalents, which I, I agree. You know, the King James is right to, to do a dynamic reading in certain places. Then he gets into a discussion on textual criticism. Now, he's basically just explaining what textual criticism is. Um, and he's saying a lot of people just don't like that it has the word criticism in it, like we're criticizing the Bible or criticizing text. He explains that's not what it means. Textual criticism means deciding which text is right and which one is wrong. You know, deciding which text we're going to use in the Greek and which text we're going to use in the Hebrew. Now, why are we as King James only as against textual criticism? Well, the reason why is that we believe in staying with the traditional text that has been passed down, not changing the Bible to go with modern discoveries, okay? So that what the textual criticism does is it digs up something new in the 20th century and then changes the Bible to go with that new discovery. You know, it discovers new manuscripts in the 1800s, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, right? And then it changes our Bible 
to match those new discoveries. Well, again, I will never believe that the true Bible was buried under the earth for centuries. Okay, so if it's something that was buried for over a thousand years, it can't be the true word of God because we believe that God preserved his word and that people have constantly been copying, preaching, reading, using God's word. And so textual criticism is constantly digging up new scraps of paper and changing the Bible because they're, they're, they're constantly trying to get the Bible closer to what it actually was written. You know, they're, they're constantly trying to bring the text closer to what the apostles actually wrote. We believe that we already have what the apostles actually wrote. We believe we've had it for the last couple thousand years. So we don't need to go digging it up somewhere. We already have it. Okay, so that's the problem that we have with so-called textual criticism. Okay. And he goes on to talk about, um, you know, his favorite manuscript, Sinai Atticus, and, and, you know, we'll get into that more later in the book. But he praises it and shows a picture of it. And it's the single greatest example of an unsealed text, yada, yada, yada. More pictures of Sinai Atticus. Then he has a section called To Err is Human. And he basically just explains the fact that, you know, all handwritten Bibles are going to have mistakes in them. They're going to have uh, just human error, scribal errors, what we would call today a typo, okay? And it's not just handwritten manuscripts that have typos. Printed Bibles have typos too. In fact, every Bible that I've ever owned, if you if I've read it long enough, I have found at least one typo in it. In fact, I was just preaching less than two weeks ago, and I was preaching out of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I came to a verse that says dominion. And I had memorized this verse in the past, and I knew it said dominion, but I looked down at my Bible, and my Bible said domination. And so I kind of stuttered and stammered, but I wasn't really feeling well that day, and I wasn't really thinking clearly. So I just trusted what was written on the page, and I started saying domination. So for the next like three or four minutes in my sermon as I'm preaching, I kept saying domination over and over again when it, it should have been dominion. But it was because my Bible had a typo in it where it said domination instead of dominion. You know, if, if you read the Bible long enough, you'll find typos in virtually every Bible. Uh, just a letter will be missing or a one line of text will be repeated twice or something like that. So, you know, yes, to err is human and every Bible is going to have typos in it or, or especially when you're doing it by hand, there are going to be mistakes. So he explains that concept, which is an obvious concept. Then he has a section called Thousands and Thousands of Variants. Okay. And he rightfully explains in here that the number of textual variants is a little bit exaggerated. Okay. He says here, and I'm going to read the paragraph here. It says, next, we must emphasize that 99% of the 400,000 variations are irrelevant to the proper translation and understanding of the Greek text. Even the most liberal textual critic agrees here. Unlike in the English language, differences in word order, especially in Greek, often are completely irrelevant. In fact, in Greek, one can say the same thing in more than a dozen different ways using differences in word order, cases, etc. Combine this with differences in spelling and other minor variations, and the number of meaningful New Testament variants drops to a more realistic number of 4,000. This represents about 2.9% of the text or one meaningful variant every three pages or so of the New Testament. Okay. So what he's saying here is that when people try to talk about just how there are just so many different variations in the text, often what they're referring to is something as simple as a misspelling. And, you know, the word misspelling is not even accurate because today in 2019, there's a right and a wrong way to spell every word. I mean, every word has a right spelling. And most of the time, there's only one right way to spell a word. Whereas in the olden times, people didn't really care about spelling. If you read uh, Tyndale's New Testament, he spells the same word three different ways on one page. Okay, why? Because part of it was just how it looked. They just thought that it would look better sometimes to make the lines longer or shorter or how they fit on the page. Um, so sometimes they'll use one spelling to make the word a little longer, just, just to look good on the page. Sometimes they'll use a shorter spelling. So it was like an art form for them. 
spelling was like an art where they would just use different spellings depending on how they wanted it to look like a poetic use of spelling okay so in the olden times spelling was not as fixed and rigid as it is right now so two manuscripts will have different spelling and people claim oh it's a variant it's different punctuation word order and in greek the word order typically doesn't matter as much as it does in english where we have to have things in a certain order in Greek, you can move things around and there's no meaningful difference. So the vast majority of textual variants are meaningless. They have no relevance at all. Okay. And by the way, let me just stop and say this. People who attack the King James say, oh, well, the King James version of 1611 is totally different than the modern King James. That's not true because there is no meaningful change between the 1611 edition and the 1769 edition that we use today. Typically, if you buy King James today, you use the 1769 edition. There's no meaningful difference, folks. It is the same words. Now, the spellings are different, the punctuation is different, and there are typos that have been corrected because the original 1611 had typos because every Bible has typos, right? So typos were corrected, spellings, punctuation, capitalizations were changed but there is no meaningful change from 1611 to 1769. So the King James is the King James, folks. Now, if you get a new King James, it is dramatically changed and it's complete uh, garbage. But I've even seen a new King James at the store that lied and said, oh, this is just the fifth in a series of revisions to the King James. You know, the King James has been revised four times. This is the fifth one. Yeah, except the first four were spellings, punctuation, and capitalization. They didn't actually change the words, okay? So anyway, he's just explaining that most textual variants, they're meaningless. And when people try to say, oh, the Textus Receptus, there are all these variants between different editions of the Textus Receptus, it's this kind of meaningless stuff typically. The vast majority of it is spelling, punctuation, capitalization, word order, and other things that don't matter. Okay. So anyway, he says that, you know, it's really only 2.9% of the text that's different or one meaningful variant every three pages or so in the New Testament. Now, so he's saying, you know, when you read the New Testament, it's only every three pages that there's a meaningful difference in the modern versions uh, text versus the King James text. Well, first of all, that's not quite true. It's a little bit more than that. But even if that's, let, let's just say that's all it is, okay? Well, if you have a major difference every three pages, and if the differences affect doctrine, which they do, you know, that's a lot of problems because the New Testament has a lot of pages, right? You know, I've got a, a typical Greek New Testament here and it's got 480 pages. So if there's a, a meaningful difference every three pages, then we're talking about 160 meaningful differences, okay? But he's saying, well, you know, 97.1% of it's right on. Well, that's not good enough, you know? It's got to be 99. It's got to be 99.44, as the old Ivory commercial said. You know, 97% um, is just not going to cut it. Um, and then he goes into an example of a difference. You know that that is. Um, uh, let's see. Does he consider this a meaningful difference? All right. Here we go. Okay, he says this is not a meaningful difference, okay? 1 John 3, 1. King James, Behold the ma what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The ESV says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. First of all, the ESV sounds lame. But it also adds this phrase, and so we are. So the King James says that we should be called the sons of God. The ESV says that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. Okay. Now, obviously the ESV is the one that's wrong here. You say, why is that? Well, because the King James is the standard, but I digress. Well, it says in verse 2, beloved, now are we the sons of God. So you already get that from verse two anyway, that we, we're not just called the sons of God, but we are the sons of God, you get from verse two. But he's saying, you know, that this addition in the ESV 
is not a meaningful addition. And I would say that you know it, it doesn't change any doctrine. This particular example doesn't change any doctrine or affect anything, but it's still adding something to the text that shouldn't be there. And the Bible says, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. So even though this is not meaningful according to him, I would say it is meaningful because it does change the meaning because it added a phrase. It doesn't affect doctrine, but I would call that a meaningful change because he added a sentence that isn't in the original. So it does change the meaning, okay? Even though it doesn't affect doctrine. Those are two different things. Then, a little bit later on, he quotes the great scholar, Dr. A.T. Robertson, whose familiarity with the most intimate details of the Greek text is abundantly verified by his massive 1,454-page a grammar of the Greek New Testament in the light of historical research indicated that areas of real concern regarding textual variants amount to a thousandth part of the entire text. So James White said first that it's about 3% of the text, but then he quotes this great scholar who's so intimate with the Greek. His 1,454-page book proves it. This guy claims, oh no, the, the real concern is only a thousandth part of the text. Well, that's not 3%. That would be 0.1%. So this guy's claiming that only 1,000th of the text is really a meaningful variant. Okay, well, let's stop and examine that claim. Okay, well, there are 7,957 verses in the New Testament. Let's just round that off and say that there are about 8,000 verses in the New Testament. So according to him, it's only one in a thousand. Okay, well, then there should only be eight problems in the whole New Testament right? Well, here's the problem with that. There are 16 entire verses removed from the modern versions because of textual variants. So just alone, the entire verses that are removed, there are 16. So how is that one one thousandth when there are only 8,000 verses? That should only be eight problems. Well, there's 16 whole verses and there are hundreds of other meaningful changes. Okay, the 3% figure is a lot closer to the truth than this bozo claiming, well, you know, don't, don't, there's nothing to see here, folks. Don't worry about all these missing verses. Don't worry about all these differences in doctrine, entire phrases, entire sentences removed. You know, it's, it's like one out of a thousand verses that's wrong. No, th this guy is, is full of baloney. No, no one could actually say that it's one in a thousand meaningful textual variants. That's why, uh, you know, White has to say, oh, he's, he has to like praise this guy and give all his qualifications because what he's about to say is so stupid that it's only one out of a thousand. That's so demonstrably false when there are 16 entire verses removed in the modern version. Not only that, forget just in the modern versions, the Westcott and Hort text, Sinaiticus Vaticanus, they also remove what, 12 entire verses from the end of the book of Mark. So Mark 16, 9 through 20 is gone. Well, there's 12 more gigantic, huge problems, entire verses missing. But I guess according to this Dr. A.T. Robertson, those don't matter. Those 12 verses being chopped out. Or how about the section in John chapter 7, verse 53 to John chapter 8, verse 11? 12 verses more. Removed. So that's 24 verses plus the 16 that are actually removed from the modern versions. So you have 40 entire verse omissions, and there are way more than that, folks. I'm just bringing up some examples. But he's trying to claim there's only eight meaningful differences in the whole New Testament that should cause us concern. No, there's a lot of problems. It's, it's more like a few hundred, okay? So why does he even quote that bozo? He contradicts what he just said on the previous page about saying it's about 3%. Then he quotes this bozo and tries to say, well, it's not even that. It's like one out of a thousand. That's ridiculous. Any Anybody could prove that wrong easily. And then he says, the reality is that the amount of variation between the two most extremely different New Testament manuscripts would not fundamentally alter the message of the scriptures. So uh, what James White says over and over again is that the changes in the modern versions don't affect doctrine. If we took the, the most different manuscripts, it still doesn't affect doctrine. And of course, we demonstrated over and over again in our film, New World Order Bible Versions, that the changes in the modern versions do affect doctrine. They affect salvation. 
they affect doctrines regarding hell and uh, the Trinity and all kinds of different things. Okay, so then on page 70, he starts to get into the different text types and families. So when we look at the almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, and when we say manuscript, we mean a handwritten document, like Spanish, mono is hand, right? Manually written, written by hand, manuscripts. So almost 6,000 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament and they're divided into four different families of manuscripts or text types, okay? So text type number one is the Alexandrian text type found in most papyri and in the great unsealed codexes Aleph and B, also known as Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Text type number two is the Western text type found both in Greek manuscripts and in translations into other languages, especially Latin. Number three is the Byzantine text type found in the vast majority of later uncial and minuscule manuscripts. And number four, the Caesarean text type, disputed by some, found in Papyrus 45 and Family 1, abbreviated F1. Okay, so he breaks it into these text types, and then he says the two ends of the spectrum, so to speak, are the Alexandrian and the Byzantine. Okay, those are the two extremes. Well, here's the thing. The King James Version is based on the Byzantine text type. The modern versions are based on the Alexandrian text type. And these are, as he says, the two extremes. Now, what is Alexandria? Alexandria is a city in Egypt. And it shouldn't really surprise us that all of these wicked Bible versions are coming from Egyptian manuscripts because of the fact that Egypt in the Bible is a place that spiritually symbolizes that which is wicked. In Revelation chapter 11, it talks about that city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. They always go down into Egypt, and Egypt represents the world. It represents sin. It represents wickedness and so forth. So that's where the modern version text type is coming from. Alexandria, Egypt. Okay, The Byzantine text type is the one underlying the King James. He says here, most scholars today in opposition to KJV onlyism would see the Alexandrian as representing an earlier and hence more accurate form of text than the Byzantine text type. So why is it that James White and other so-called scholars favor the Alexandrian text type? The answer is because they have some very extremely old examples of the Alexandrian text time. They have these very old papyrus fragments of little scraps of a verse here, verse there, or sometimes, you know, larger portions from Egypt. And then they also have their beloved Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, which by the way, are from the fourth century AD. So they say, well, these are older and more reliable. Well, the fourth century AD is several hundred years after the fact, folks. So that's plenty of time for them to be corrupted and changed. So this is a philosophical difference between King James only and the textual criticism crowd. What's the fundamental difference? I keep coming back to this, folks. The fundamental difference is that we believe in the received text that was passed down to us. They believe in digging up something that's been buried for over a thousand years and changing the Bible based on new findings that they just dug up recently, okay? So, because they say, well, this is older. Older does not necessarily mean better or more reliable. Just because it's from 300 years after the time of the apostles versus 700 years after the time of the apostles, folks, that's still way later, okay? It makes more sense to believe that the one that God has used over the years that's been copied and preached and read and used and uh, it's been used to win people to the Lord for centuries is the right Bible, not the one that had to be dug up by an archaeologist in the 19th century or even the 20th century. Okay, the true Bible was not buried, folks. I'll never believe that. It's nonsense. So, you know, the King James only crowd promotes the Byzantine text type. The Alexandrian text type is promoted by the modern version crowd. They're, they're the spiritual Egypt folks with their Egyptian corrupted Bible. 
Okay, on page 72, he says the Byzantine text type represents the vast majority of the Greek manuscripts available to us today. So the vast majority of manuscripts are the Byzantine text type, the one that lines up with the King James. It's this small minority of Egyptian garbage that the modern versions are based on, okay? Page 73 says another common KJV only claim is that the Alexandrian texts have been corrupted by heretics. They point to men like Origen, who did things and believed things that most modern fundamentalists would find more than slightly unusual. Yeah, you can say that again since Origen cut his own nuts off, okay? But I digress. Origen, of course, was just a complete heretic, wicked person who castrated himself and and believed all kinds of goofy, crazy things and wicked things. And, and, and yeah, he was a Bible corrupter. He is behind a lot of the corruption in the modern versions. And other heretics like him corrupted the Bible. Uh, whether they did it on purpose or not, maybe they were demon-possessed when they did it. But the devil's behind it, folks. And the devil used wicked men like Origen to corrupt the Bible. Okay. Verse, uh, page 74 he talks about the fact that the Byzantine text type is fuller or longer than other text types and that this is taken as evidence of a later origin. So they're claiming that the Byzantine text type is later and less reliable because it's, it's fuller, it's longer. So they think things have been added to it. Whereas we would say that the Alexandrian texts have omitted things. They've removed things. Uh, these guys believe it's more likely that stuff was added than removed. Okay, which obviously they're wrong. He talks about on page 76, expansion of piety. That basically people were just adding words to the Bible in order to give God more glory. So, you know, if it says Jesus, they'll put Lord Jesus. If it says uh, Jesus Christ, they'll put Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if, if it says Lord, they'll put you know, Lord Jesus Christ or what, you know, that they're expanding it to give more glory. Whereas we that are of the King James only persuasion would say that the Alexandrian texts are omitting titles. They're getting sloppy and omitting titles and, and, and taking out. Because if you look at the modern versions versus the King James, they omit Lord scores of times. They omit Jesus scores of times. They omit Christ scores of times. So they're constantly downgrading the title, whereas uh, the King James has it intact. The textual critics will say, well, no, 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 they, they, this is an expansion. These terms are being added. So he, he explains that. And then um, he has a section at the end called A Final Word on the New Testament Text. He says... KJV-only advocates are quick to assert that those who do not join them in making the King James Version the final authority in all things do not believe in the preservation of Scripture. And yet, that is what we're saying, because James White doesn't believe in the preservation of Scripture. He thinks that we have to keep digging up new things to try to somehow reconstruct what the Bible said when the apostles wrote it. I mean, if we dig up something tomorrow that scholars date and test and say this is older and more reliable, some papyrus is found, James White will literally change his Bible to match that papyrus. I mean, that, that they'll, they'll come out with a new edition of his Greek New Testament, folks. So, yeah, how can you say you believe in the preservation of Scripture when you want to change Scripture based on findings in the 19th and 20th century and even the 21st century? They're ready to change it again, folks. Well, I, you know, you keep using that word preservation. I don't think it means what you think it means. You know, if the, if, the, if the Bible's been preserved unto us, we don't have to go dig it out of a hole somewhere and find something new to somehow reconstruct the original. When we see how God led his people to recognize the canon of Scripture, the listing of the books that were inspired over against those books that were not we note that he did not therein engage in any celestial fireworks. No angels showed up with golden tablets marked divine index. Instead, God worked with his people over time, leading them to recognize what he had already done through the act of inspiration. The same is true regarding the protection and preservation of the biblical text. Now, I agree with that right there. He's saying right there, look, 
How do we know which books are part of the Bible and which ones aren't? Because God's people can recognize what is inspired from what is not inspired, okay? I believe that, okay? That's why I believe the King James. Because the Holy Spirit tells me that the King James is the Word of God. When I hear the King James Version, the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that that's the Word of God. I hear the voice of the shepherd. I recognize the voice of the shepherd. And when I read the Apocrypha, that's not the voice of the shepherd. When I read the Book of Mormon or the Quran or the Tao Te Ching, it says that's the voice of strangers. But when you read the Bible, it's the voice of the shepherd. When you read the Gospel of Thomas, the Book of Enoch, it's garbage. The Holy Spirit will not testify unto you of those things. When you read the King James Bible, God speaks to your heart and you know that it's the Word of God. Okay. So, you know, he's acknowledging the fact that, that God leads us. But yet, when I told James White that the reason I believe the King James Bible is that, you know, it's the I recognize the voice of the shepherd and that the new versions are false because, you know, I hear them and I can tell that they're false because the Holy Spirit guides me into all truth. You know, he acted like that's a ridiculous reason. He didn't accept that reason. Okay, but yet in his book here, he explains, well, that's how we knew which books are right and which ones aren't. The Holy Spirit's guidance. Well, you know, it, it's kind of a double standard here because he, he says that God leads his people to recognize what he's already done through the act of inspiration. So how do we know the King James is inspired? Because we read it and it has the power of God. It's the Bible that has power. It's the Bible that gets the job done. What's the fruit of these modern versions? A bunch of liberalism and garbage and lame, watered-down churches. Look, all the best churches are preaching out of the King James, folks. Best according to who? Best according to the Holy Spirit, friend. And if you are sincere, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. And when you read the King James Bible, the Holy Spirit will speak to you, and you will hear the voice of the shepherd. Whereas these modern versions are the voice of a stranger, okay? And so after that part, he then has a 10-page um, section that's kind of not relevant. It's something that was added in this edition. It's not in the original 1995 edition of the book. He added this for 2009. And basically, he's just explaining that he's better at debating Muslims because he's not King James only. You know, that's what he wants to explain, how he's so good at, at debating these Muslims and how King James only is are not gonna be able to debate the Muslims. You know, I don't wanna debate the Muslims. I wanna preach the gospel to Muslims. And you know, debating people doesn't get them saved. I mean, arguing with Muslims isn't what gets them saved, folks. You gotta preach them the gospel. It's the power of God's word and the power of the gospel story that's gonna bring salvation. Uh, it's not a bunch of archeology span and textual criticism. That stuff just doesn't win people to Christ, folks. So anyway, that's chapter three in the book. And again, it was a, a, a chapter that he even said you could skip because it's just a lot of basic things about the um, authorship and transmission of the text. So in the next video, we'll get into chapter four called Putting It Together, where uh, we get into a lot more specific things between the King James and the modern versions. God bless you. Have a great day.